Hey matching guys, all the my other name is uh, Zach Both, and uh, we're gonna put some beams in. Put some beams in. We're gonna stick them down. So I'm Zach Both. ZachBoth.com. Follow me on Instagram. This week on Do It Yourself. Mm. Do It Yurt Self. This week on Do It Yourself, we're going to be building the platform that the yurt is going to sit on. This is the probably one of the most important parts of the whole process. You want to get it right. This is a, a little precarious. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to find the center point of the yurt. Yurts are obviously circle. Uh, so you're going to just take a stake. Take a string line, measure it out to the radius of the yurt. In this case, I'm building a 30-foot yurt, so this is a 15-foot radius. And I just walked around just to try to figure out, okay, this is essentially where the yurt is going to be. Once I have the center point, then I can build off of that. And the first thing that you need to do is find a right angle. Because then from there, you can make sure everything else is square. Your lines are parallel or perpendicular to each other. You're going to go back to high school geometry class. You're going to pull out Pythagorean theorem. And essentially, it's just a 3, 4, 5 rule. So you're going to measure 3 feet here, 4 feet here. And if it's square, if it's a right angle, this is going to be 5 feet. I'm like, oh, everything needs to be straight. And they're not straight. I'm working off uh, pre-engineered plans. I'm not a structural engineer. Far from it. I took the plans that Rainier gave me to build this 30-foot yurt, and it shows where all the posts need to be. So there's going to be two over there, four here, four here, and two over there. I need to come out with lines that I can find where the posts are going to sit. You run these lines along your, your right angle, and you extend them past where you're going to be building the platform. That just makes it easier when you have to remove the line because you're digging the hole, uh, you leave the batter boards where they are, and you can put the line back once you're done digging holes or whatever you want to do. I don't need these. Whew. Once you have all your stakes in and your lines are in place and you're feeling pretty confident about it all, then you can start marking out where your posts are going to go. And you're going to work off the engineer plans that are going to tell you, okay, from this perpendicular, you're going to measure off five feet, and that's where that post is going to go or these are going to be 4 feet or 12 feet. One of these posts is 5 feet from this mark right here. So I'm going to measure 5 feet and just mark on the string with a sharpie or marker 5 feet. Then I'm going to take a plumb bob or just anything heavy on a string and measure down from that mark on the string down to the ground. Once I have that, I can take uh, some rebar or something around here, push that in. There we go. Do the magic of cinema, paint it. <laughs> That's where one of the posts are going to go. So you're going to put that for all the other uh, posts. And so when you dig, you know exactly where you're digging. We're going to be digging our holes the old-fashioned way. Some good old manual labor with a post hole digger. How many of these do we have to do? Twelve? Oh god. Alright, I think I got something that might work a little better.
Not bad, right? Just found this back there. This is a Toro Dingo. There's a couple other models like it, but this will make the hole digging very easy. There are other options between the post hole digger and this guy. They do make these augers, handheld augers, uh, that are either gas or electric powered, that can be operated by one man or two man, but they are still backbreaking work and you have to do a lot of lifting in order to operate those. Uh, and sometimes those augers, this auger bit on those machines only go up to a certain diameter. So I rented this guy and this guy. This guy, it was relatively inexpensive for the day. Other than that, I think we just should start digging. Little recap, um, that did not go well. <laughs> I guess what uh, you should know is that if you're working in a muddy area, this is probably not the best idea. It's, you know, about 2,000 pounds and uh, gets stuck very easily. Didn't even get a single hole drilled. <laughs> So I, uh, I'm going to regroup and uh, see you in a little bit. a good layer of gravel on the bottom about maybe uh, three to six inches grab our tamper and just tap tamp on the inside we're just gonna double check triple check the length and the position it's actually right on the money. Level all the way around. You know, I've been coming out here in the morning and finding frogs on the bottom of these holes. They're like death traps. But uh, the conservationist in me takes a little shovel, scoops them out. They try to jump in now and they're pouring the concrete. RIP. According to code here, uh, these sono tubes need to be six inches above grade above the ground. We're gonna cut off about five inches and uh, it should be at the right height uh, for pouring. We're gonna put the side that we cut down in the gravel because um, we'll be able to level out any inconsistencies of my cutting uh, and put the factory edge right on top. This is going to be its final spot, so we got to make sure it's level and at the right distance from the center line. The center line, five feet. We are going to backfill this tube uh, so that it's nice in place when we decide to pour the concrete. There we go. Yep. 
Now that our holes are dug and the concrete forms are in the holes, uh, we can talk about these post footings. These are kind of standard now. About 10 years ago, you would just stick the post right in the concrete, um, but today they have these Simpson strong tie footings that are embedded into the concrete. So the engineering plans that we got from Rainier call for four by four post footings. However, after looking at the building codes in this area, um, we're required to use four by sixes. We spent a little more, got the four by sixes because our beams are gonna be spliced on top and the local code calls for four by sixes in that case. It goes to show how important it is to check your local building codes and, uh, and, and change your plan, modify it um, based on what's required. These are a pretty penny. They're about 50 bucks a pop, but when it comes to your foundation, everything that's holding your yurt up, these are worth the cost. The last thing that we need to do is put one string line across these footings so that these guys all line up with each other. This is about four inches. So we take two inches and we'll just measure right off this center line and put another string line all the way across. We're gonna start mixing the concrete. And what you're looking for is almost like a commercial grade, high strength concrete, just because these footings are so important. So we're getting this Quickrete 5000, 5000 PSI, it should do, do the job. And it sets relatively easily and relatively quickly. So we can start building almost within a day or two. Zach, you gonna haul the first bucket? I thought You're I was not gonna, gonna make an old man do it, are you? <laughs> All right. Oh, God. Oh. Lift with your legs, not with your back. Boy, I could just lift things with my mind. Lift things with my mind. Lift things with my mind. For some uh, context, that was four bags, and we are about half, halfway full. Now that it's almost full, before we fill it up to the top, we're gonna take a rebar and just really jam it in there. Try to get any of those air pockets out. Tappy tap. We can take our four rebar. These are about 28 inches long for a 39 inch hole. We're gonna stick these four kind of in a diagonal or a square. And you wanna leave about three inches from the edge to the rebar. Nice little diagonal. Bye bye, little rebar. No. Put a little, little bit of this back. We'll edit this in post. <laughs> Mix up that extra back that you put in there. You might have to do it a couple times. Because this is a four by six, it doesn't matter which way we orient, orient it. Um, so we're gonna orient it this way. And, <laughs> whoo, a little nervous. Get some of the mud off a little bit. Line up this edge. In fact, you might, you, you have your hammer? Where's that hammer, Nicole? <laughs> Check for level. Close. Yeah. If we're going to be building the subframe for our platform, uh, and the first step of that is putting in the post into the, the post connector, uh, whatever you want to call them that are embedded into the concrete. And because we're on a slight slope, and the concrete forms are at different heights, 
we are going to have to cut these posts to different uh, height to make this platform level. There's a couple ways for you to do that. One, you can use a water level. You can also use a bubble string level. We're gonna go a little fancier. You can pick these up at most tool rental shops. This right here is a laser level. I have to read the instruction manual because there's buttons and I don't know what they do. So now our laser level is set up in the center of our workspace. It itself is level. Uh, this particular model is self-leveling. Um, but once that is set up, we can now determine the height of all of our posts. And the way you do that is a, there's a little laser on top of that and it's going back and forth, back and forth. And you should be able to see it on one of these guys on a tape measure. You simply just go around going to all your posts marking out the temp uh, the height not the temperature the height of all the posts should be able to see it there we go the laser get a close-up of my dirty fingernails so it looks to be about 22 and 7 eighths so we're just going to write it right on the 18 So now that we have our post measurements that we got from the laser level, the next step is to decide which post we want to be our control post. And that's gonna help us determine the height of all the other posts. We're gonna say this is gonna be our control post. From here, you're gonna decide how tall you want just your post to be, based on your build, local building code or, or the terrain, what might look good. And you have to remember that you're gonna have the beams on top of that and either your joists or your sit panels on top of that. For this, we're gonna say, just for example, that we want these posts, this post right here, to be 16 inches. So now that we have 16 inches, I know that this measurement from here is 22 and 7 eighths inch from this base plate to the laser that we set up. We're gonna subtract 16 inches from 22 and 7 eighths, which is 6 and 7 eighths inch, and now we're gonna take that measurement, six and seven eighths inch, and deduct that from all the other measurements, the unique measurements that we got from the laser. And that will decide and, and, and tell us how tall those posts should be to get to this level, exactly this level. It's a little complicated. Take some, some you know, math, scribble it down on a piece of paper, um, but at, in the end, you'll have something that is pretty level, and you can build right on top of that. All right, time to get a pencil. Ooh, yeah, can we pull out the string lines? God, I hate these things. I never want to do anything with strings again. I'm looking forward to that all week. Yes, I have. <laughs> Try the other one. There we go. Before we uh, got the saw, what was your plan for all these posts? How were we gonna cut these? By hand. <laughs> hand saw, like in the olden days. This, this could all be right, terrible. Order it up. Number one! Number ten! Oh! Number five! Number nine! Number four, order up! Number three, order up! Oh! All right, last call, number two. Oh. I'm glad you have your glasses on. You might need a hard hat. <laughs> right there. That's crazy. With the laser level, we, it has to be all yeah. good. There we go. Batting a thousand.
Now that we have our 4x6 posts in, or for you it might be 4x4 four four posts, we're going to put these post caps on and essentially you put one on each side and your beam sits on top of this and you're able to attach your post to your beam with this post cap bracket. If you hold the hammer further back, you get more. Okay. He's been working construction for 30 years. <laughs> Whoa. All right, so now that we have all of our post caps in, we can start placing our beams in as well. Uh, and for the beams, you're going to want to reference your engineering plans that either Rainier or, or someone else uh, provided you. And some of these beams, you're going to have spliced. And that pretty much means that there are two beams that meet and adjoin right in the middle one extending this way, one extending that way. But for at least these two, these shorter ones in the front and those two in the back, we can use one single beam that extends all the way across. I guess we just start sliding them in. That should do it. This thing is going nowhere. When you're building your yurt, it sits on a platform. And pretty much there are two ways to go about building that platform. You can either uh, use regular joists and put uh, either plywood, sheets, or uh, boards on top of those joists. Or the other option is to get something like this. These are structurally insulated panels, or SIPs for short. And these are pre-made and they're insulated inside and pretty much cut to a circular shape already. So it's, it's almost like puzzle pieces that you're putting together. They are a little pricey, but it does save a ton of time. These typically go up in about a day. Before we can install these SIPs, it's best practice to pretty much seal them uh, and, and weatherproof them from any moisture, mold, mildew. Uh, I think traditional exterior house paint should kind of cover the bases. My wonderful girlfriend over here is taking a break from hard labor and, and doing even harder labor. Everyone loves a beautiful lady painting st structurally insulated panels. <laughs> is there any uh, method to your madness that you would like to share? Is it too early for wine? <laughs> right here, this is our master plan. All the SIP boards have a number that correspond to this plan and we're going to start from the middle and build out. We're starting from the center, and this is really the most important part of this whole process. You want to get this right, um, because you're building off of this, and if this is not square, everything else won't be square either. So we're going to spend a little extra time making sure that this is completely centered where we want it to be, and from there, once this is good, we'll screw it in, and the rest should be just like putting in puzzle pieces. In between the SIP panels right here, you have to put a SIP spline, which is pretty much a, a piece of wood, what is the equivalent of a three by six, that is flush to this and flush to the, the piece next to it. And then you can drill in from the top and glue them in, and that's how you attach these boards together so that they don't come apart later. Officially, what they recommend is that you get two by sixes, and you gang those two by sixes together to make a three by six. That's the line that we need to cut to make that angle. How are we going to cut these? Handsaw, like in the olden days. <laughs> now we're going to take a planer 
plane off at 16th off the top and bottom and then bevel the edges to make a nice easy fit. I think we're ready for the next piece, the holy matrimony of structurally insulated panels. When we built this subframe, we intentionally put in longer beams because after talking with some people, they actually said that you want these longer than what the engineering plans call for. Then we took the, the SIP panels and dry fit them in. And dry fitting means you're just, you're not screwing things in, you're just kind of setting it in place uh, in, into position. Once the SIP panels were in, we were able to measure about six to seven inches, in our case, seven inches from the edge of that SIP panel to the beam. And that seven inches gives you enough space for your pursing cable, which cinches your, your yurt fabric uh, nice and tight underneath your, uh, your platform. Uh, so we put that in, measured seven inches, and marked it here. Once you got your line, you can start cutting. Either you can get a chainsaw. Chainsaw will cut right through this. But for us, you know the drill. We're going to go with a good old handsaw. Once again, I don't know why. All right, let's go get lunch. <laughs> Look at that. I totally just got shit on by a bird. What? <laughs> Five days since my last shower, anyways. I needed one. Yo, Jimmy, that guy's filming something down there. Oh, Let's yeah. get him. That was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> We're ready to put these 45 beam, 45 degree beams in that will hold the corner sips up. We have our beam in place based on what the measurement was, and we're just going to scribe underneath to get the exact line that we need to cut. Bingo. When the SIP panels are installed on the subframe of your platform, they still need to be attached to the subframe. They can't just sit there. So we use these guys. This came with the SIP package. These are leg screws. They go down through the plywood, through either this SIP spline, which is foam, or the three by sixes that we made, and down into our beam. And that gives it the real strength that holds this whole platform to the, uh, the frame that we built underneath. You want these things flush with the plywood, so we're going to countersink. Bunch of times. Do it a lot. Poke, poke, poke. One of the last steps that we need to do before starting our yurt build is putting a, a, a perimeter around the yurt platform. That's just so that we have something to secure the lattice into, um, as well as mark out our story strip later, um, that which tells us pretty much where everything goes. Now the way to do that, you're going to want to use some solid uh, wood, preferably pressure treated, but obviously going around a circle is a little difficult with boards like this. You want to do something called kerfing. Um, which will take this straight board that does not bend and turn it into something 
that does. And you can see this board is already curved and will bend all the way around that circle. And we'll have about eight of these that will encompass the circumference of our platform. Our engineering plans tell us pretty much exactly what to do um, as far as where to cut and how deep. And we're going to leave about 3 8 inch of meat of wood um, from our cut. Again, if you cut too deep, it's going to snap when you try to bend it. If you cut too shallow, it's not going to bend at all. Um, and then we're going to space these out two inches apart from each other. And that should give us the result of, of bending a, a straight board. Time to install the kerf board. All right, so now that it's dry fit in here, we're gonna take good old screw gun, every six inches, top and bottom. I hand this off to you, the gauntlet. <laughs> so we're here at Goodwood in Portland, Oregon. They do deconstruction of old houses and take all the wood here and sell it to people that want to repurpose it. So we have a ton of uh, dug fir tongue and groove flooring that we're going to use for the flooring of our yurt. Most yurts that I've seen use some sort of engineered flooring. Those are really nice because uh, a lot of them are water resistant and do snap in place. But these you just can't beat. You can't beat the character that's in these, you know, boards that are almost 100 years old. We're going to load this all up, pray that we have enough to cover the floor of our yurt. So let's get loaded. This place is like a dream for any DIY uh, woodworking person. They have, you know, one by twos and, and wall clad and big beams. It's, it's beautiful, beautiful wood. And I would recommend anyone in the Portland area to check it out maybe pick some up for your own project. The coal stacks are a lot neater when she comes out. <laughs> that one's better. And she, uh, she carries more. <laughs> They're with their flooring, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe I should talk about what we're doing. Normally, you would put the floor in before the yurt goes up. There's a number of reasons why uh, we were unable to put the floor in. And the first reason being, we have no time. Using salvaged wood, it takes a lot of energy to prep the, all the boards. What these wonderful folks behind us are doing. So instead, we're doing the perimeter all the way around the circle, which is what the lattice is gonna sit on. We're gonna trim it. And then after the yurt is all done, we'll come in and, and fill it in with the, the, the rest of the flooring. It's not ideal, but you know, time is of the essence right now, so it's what we're working with. It's gonna be a late night. Very late night. <laughs> Shaking the camera, yes. You ever see that movie Cutting Edge about the ice skater that was a hockey player and he screws his eye up and she's a figure skater? He out, in, out east in Connecticut has, long story short, so he, he ends up, she needs a partner. Nobody will work with her because she's a pain in the butt. play hockey anymore, but he loves to skate. She decides, okay, well, we're going to try this. Well, they, they were racing to get up in the morning to see who got up first. I beat my son out here this morning. His favorite movie is a figure skating movie. It's a, it's a romance. I like chick flicks. What can I say? I'm a sensitive guy. 